Hello and welcome to this, our final AMTS, The Nutritionist of the Year. I am Marianne Fezenden from AMTS. Thank you for joining us today. Ordinarily, at this point, I offer an introduction of our speaker. This month's speaker, Sam Fezenden, has included the essentiality of what I prepared in his opening slides, so I will not offer repetition. I will say, for those of you who do not know, one of my greatest career pleasures has been the opportunity to work with my son. I was delighted when he joined our team after completing his PhD and do miss what was his more active role at AMTS. My husband and I both come from farm backgrounds and are delighted to share in the next chapter Sam has laid out. With no more rambling on, let's enjoy Sam's very personal presentation. Okay, thank you. And welcome to the presentation. I'm going to be giving a little bit of a perspective from, from a robot dairy um, that my wife and I and her parents started up here uh, just over a year ago. So I am glad you were all able to join us. Um, for those that I've worked with in the past, I hope you are doing well. And then, of course, anyone that I may interact with in the future, I also hope you find something useful out of this. Um, it's a little bit of a change for me from going from the, the training and support and technical development for uh, AMTS to now a full-time dairy farmer um, and doing a little bit of AMTS work on the side. So I hope you guys can find this useful. And uh, with that, we'll dive right into it. So to give you a, a kind of a brief background, kind of what my perspective is coming from, I'll give you just a, a quick run through of, of my, I guess my little bit of my history. I grew up on a 500 cow dairy in central New York. Um, and that's where I probably first got my taste of, of farming and, and interacting with animals and um, kind of enjoying that whole system. Uh, for my undergraduate, I went to Cornell University uh, to work on dairy science and dairy nutrition. Um, then I got my master's from University of Minnesota, working with Dr. Marshall Stern, focusing mostly on rumen fermentation. Uh, he has a, or, or I guess the lab used to be more of an in vitro lab and we used continuous culture fermenters there. Um, so it was kind of a really unique opportunity for me to work with someone like Marshall um, and really learn the ins and outs of the rumen through the use of artificial um, rumens or, or continuous culture fermenters. I then actually came back to Cornell for my PhD work with uh, Mike and worked on the what will be the future version of the CNCPS, uh, focusing mostly on amino acid supply predictions we did some pretty um, pretty fun studies with omasal flows and doing a lot of intense research in that way. Um, and then, of course, working with Mike and his lab there at Cornell um, was, was a lot of fun and, and uh, got to work with a lot of really great people. So after my PhD work was done, I joined AMTS in October 2016 focusing mostly on nutrition support and teaching the basics of the CNCPS or basics and advanced portions of the CNCPS uh, methodology, and also on product development for amts.cattlepro and what will be future versions of that program. Uh, much of my work was focused in North America and Europe. I was, I was doing quite a bit of work in Europe um, in the pre-COVID times. Um, and so I really enjoyed that and was able to make some good connections and, uh, yeah, hopefully some people are here from those different, uh, areas. So, uh, and then in 2020, uh, started a dairy farm with my wife's family, um, here in Minnesota where I live now. Uh, so this is my, my full-time job plus a little bit more. And I do some part-time consulting and training with AMTS, uh, still and a few key clients. Um, so this is, this is what my wife and I have kind of always long wanted to do. And, and, um, it's been really an interesting experience in the last year plus, and also building a dairy during COVID was an interesting experience too, but we got it done and we're moving forward. So that's going well. Hopefully I'll kind of be able to show off the farm a little bit here in the next few slides. So to kind of give you an overview of what we're going to do today, uh, I'll give you an overview of what our, our farm looks like right now. That's Silver Spirit Farm and a couple of the different things I've learned through that process, um, mostly oriented around the interaction of, of cows and their environment and cows behavior. And then of course, using the data that comes out of the robot systems um, and just kind of hopefully given a few different thoughts there. I'll also walk through what we are doing in our robot herd for feeding or what I'm doing there, um, kind of giving me some idea of what our, our diets are and, and what we've learned over the last year or so. Um, and then, 
Uh, we'll focus a little bit on the, the, the diet structure and PEU NDF. Some of the items that I really keep a close eye on um, I, or I have found over time are really important to uh, focus on. We'll also do some formulation in AMTS as well to kind of show that interaction between the, the on-farm reality and the um, computer programming. So the overview of the farm, uh, we uh, farm with my wife's parents, Craig and Kathy. Uh, they started the dairy back in 1989 here at this site as a 75 cow dairy in a, a stanchion uh, barn. And up until 2011, they were milking cows here. All the kids went off to school and, and Craig lost his, his milking help. So um, he decided to sell, or Craig and Kathy decided to sell the cows at that time and transition over to more of a feedlot operation just to help manage the labor um, aspect of things. Uh, they raise Holstein steers during that period from basically one to two day old, um, all the way up to either feeder weight at around 325 kgs um, or a finish weight of 670 uh, kilos. Um, so that's kind of what their bread and butter was, was working on those, those Holstein steers. Uh, when Brenda and I came back, um, we started kind of that process of transitioning and uh, decided to build a robot dairy barn back in, and um, we started up in 2020 and we transitioned the dairy back to a dairy farm. Um, we're currently milking right around 120 cows. Uh, my wife and I also have a small helper of our own coming up through the ranks, um, Hannah. And so it's been a lot of fun to be raising her on the farm, um, which is kind of always our goal. And we have another one due here in a couple of weeks. So that's uh, our expanding family. From the dairy side of things, this is an overview of, of the dairy kind of numbers, or at least what our, our current stats are. Um, so we've got 120 milking Holstein cows. Uh, we're currently sitting right around 42 kilos of milk at 4.1 fat and 3.15 protein. Um, our last year average max cell has been right around 90,000. Um, it is a sand bedded barn, so that kind of helps out with that good low number. Uh, energy corrected is typically between 95 and 100. There's some fluctuations there based on when we calve in animals and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, right now we're sitting in that in that zone. Uh, milk solids of just over three kilos shipped per cow per day. And our days in milk right now are right around 150. We typically average between 90 and 100 days open um, and somewhere around a 28% preg rate. Uh, we do raise all of our own heifers here on site. We are targeting 22 to 23 age at first calving. Um, since we started up in 2020, we actually don't have any of our own heifers coming in yet. Um, we've been purchasing heifers as we need them. Um, but starting here in uh, um, the next year, we'll have our own heifers coming in. Um, so we're kind of building up those numbers as we go. Uh, we use principally sex semen and beef semen we use very little conventional holstein semen um, the decisions of sex and beef are based on genomic testing of the animals and the the dairy crossbred steers that we um, have here on the farm are raised to that feeder or finishing weight um, as well so basically any animal born on the farm we raise until they leave the farm at either this weight um, as a feeder or a finish and that way we're able to capture a little bit more of the, the margins hopefully and um yeah it works fairly well for us it gives us a little bit of a diversified operation um, which is really key to making this work for us so getting back to the dairy barn itself uh this is the kind of computer generated images you know and are going through the planning process but it kind of gives you a good overview of what the the barn itself looks like um, Instead of doing a walkthrough tour, which just wasn't gonna quite work out for this presentation, um, I'm kind of doing more of a photo tour. So that's why we're seeing these pictures here. Uh, it's a um, right around 109 stalls, 109, 910 stalls in the barn, uh, three row setup, indoor feeding along one side, and then the robots are um, have access to the robots right on the side of the, the barn, as you can see here. Um, it's a, yeah, fairly simple setup. We have quite a few barns in this area that are in a that are built in a similar manner and it's a very um it's a barn that makes good milk and makes you know good happy cows so um this is something that we saw that worked and so we decided we weren't gonna mess with that too much this is a, a good design for us 
Okay, so we'll use the next few slides mostly just as pictures to show you a little bit of what um, our dairy looks like, or at least the, the robot barn, um, just to kind of give you an idea of what we're talking about as I kind of go into the rest of the presentation. So uh, you can see it's a, it's a three row freestall barn um, where we have feeding on one side over here, uh, two rows of head-to-head -head freestalls, and then one row of freestalls along the far wall. And that's also where the two Lely A5 uh, robots are as well. Uh, it's a free flow design and um, we're trying to keep as much open area and free access to the robots as we can. Um, so you can kind of see from the picture also we do have other systems in place to try to reduce the amount of times we need to um, disrupt the cows. So we have alley scrapers, we have um, automatically controlled waters or automatically controlled uh, sprinklers and fans and uh, curtains to really try to make the best environment possible for the cows. Our, our stalls are 50-inch uh, stalls. We tried to put a little bit bigger stalls to try to accommodate um, um, the larger cows in the herd and keep everything comfortable. I think we succeeded in that. Uh, typically, cows lie in the stalls very well and are, are quite comfortable. So um, this is just a nice picture that I took one day. I was like, hey, they're all lying down nicely. So I took a picture. Uh, this is a picture of a, of a scale, so if you have listened to any of my trainings or, or been in any of my trainings or any AMTS training really, um, you'll know that focusing on getting good body weights for the animals is an important thing, um, mostly for nutrition management and understanding what to put in for the program, but also it helps from a herd management standpoint too, of knowing how much, uh, how much a cow may lose or gain condition um or, or or body weight uh, throughout the lactation has been it's been useful for us um and it's also kind of just neat to see the differences in animals um from our smallest smallest cow to our biggest cow you know it's, it's always a, a good thing to have so um this is the scales that i use it's actually a home built scale we didn't really want to pay for the extra fee on the Lely robots for the the scales so we um went with our own here uh this is the robot room itself uh two a5s and a you know, design where they could both are having the milking arm coming under the right hand side of the cow and there is pass through sorting so they can get sorted off to a side pen if we need to do something with them. So it's a very uh, simple design for us, but it works well. From a feeding standpoint, uh, we have a PMR and concentrate. So I'll go into that here a little bit and then throughout the rest of the presentation. Um, but basically, we feed once a day in the mornings, uh, two batches, so two different feed drops about, an, about two hours apart. Um, and we do have an automatic feed pusher uh, to push up feed throughout the day, and that helps keep the feed within reach of the cows. Um, so. And this is our concentrate system. Uh, we have three bins outside of the robot rooms, uh, one of them on the right here. This is for our ground corn, and we do mix a little bit of amino acid in with that. And on the left are two bigger bulk bins so we can take a full uh, truckload of a commodity corn gluten feed pellet um, and that gets fed in the robots as well. A couple quick notes on barn design. Uh, first, all my perspective here is from a free flow system. So it's maybe not going to be quite as useful for those that are more familiar or are consulting on a guided flow system. Um, that being said, the guided or controlled flow systems, they can and do work well for some farms. Um, it really just comes down to what's, what's going to be the right match for each individual farmer and how they want to manage their day. Um, in our case, the free flow made the most sense to us, and that's why we chose it. Um, it just made sense to kind of let the cows do what they wanted to do, and we would manage the fetch cows um, kind of as, as needed uh, instead of trying to, to guide cows through a specific route each day we decided to go with the free flow. Uh, purposefully, our barn is built with a lot of open area, especially near the robots. And that's really to help get those most timid cows to come to the robots, even if there is a boss cow somewhere close by. Uh, currently, I'm fetching right around four to 5% of the herd, um, two times a day fetching. So I typically have four to six cows on my fetch list. Um, and it's usually just late lactation cows or, or fresh heifers. Um, so that's tends to be what we have. If I'm undercrowded or if I have fewer cows per robot, then I'm really only talking about, uh, you know, maybe one or two fetch cows or sometimes zero. I've had a couple of weeks where I had no fetch cows, just they were pretty happy with what was going on and it was working well for them. 
Uh, I will say cows do seem to exhibit a more natural behavior than free stall herds that I've been in. Um, basically, when you're walking around the herd, no one's really moving anywhere to go get milked and they don't, they're not used to being pushed around for a milking. So um, yeah, it, it's an interesting dynamic that we saw change over the first three weeks of, of starting the robot herd as everyone all of a sudden started not moving as often. So they, did, you know, all the cows didn't really uh, get used to going to the parlor anymore and they were fine with just kind of standing there while you walked around. So this is a picture of right outside the robots. You can just see a lot of free space, a lot of open space to basically let cows do what they want to do. Um, and we do have gates that we can set up to allow the fetch to, or the yeah, fetch process to go. But uh, yeah, it's a fairly simple design for us. Uh, so a couple notes on the cow behavior. We purchased our milking herd from several sources because we were a green dairy, a new startup dairy. We didn't have our own cows here, obviously. So we had to go out and purchase cows. So we purchased uh, an entire herd from our neighbor who was looking to get out of the business. Um, they were milking a fairly good uh, milking herd. Um, we also purchased 20 robot trained cows from a, a, a good robot herd. They were A3 herd, which is gonna be important here in a second. And we also purchased some first and second lactation cows from a larger local a well-managed herd in our area. Um, they were a 3X parlor dairy. Um, so they were some, some good younger cows to help uh, fill out our herd there. Now, what's very interesting about this to me was that we had a whole bunch of different milking behaviors coming from these, these farms. Um, and what's really interesting is that the large herd animals, that first and second lactation cows, they had two, or they currently have two times the refusal rate at similar levels of production, meaning that with the same milk access tables, meaning they have the same access to the robots, you know, but based on their days in milk and their milk production, these animals come in and get refused twice as often as the other animals. So they're just coming to the robot twice as often. And so, you know, if they just have a drive to get milk or they just want to come up to the robot, they want the feed, whatever it might be, the fetch rate on that specific herd is less than 0.5 percent it is incredibly rare for me to have to fetch a herd or fetch a cow that came from that uh larger 3x per day parlor herd and one of the things that i think might be playing into it is that they were limit fed as pregnant heifers when they were springers or that bred heifer stage they were limit fed so they kind of got and learned this this method of eating that's just Get to the food as fast as you can find the best food get to the food that's that's what's programmed into them from when they were you know heifers and you know my hypothesis here is that you know and this is based on other other situations as well that i've seen over the years that I, I think this limit feeding can result in lifelong feeding behavior changes um most of the time i'd say they're not ones that we want to see such as slug feeding or competitive um, behaviors at the bunk um, those are things that we don't necessarily like to see that I, that we do know come from, um, limit fed as, as heifers. Um, but what's interesting in my case here is that these animals seem to really want to come to the robots and get that, that, uh, concentrates in the robots. So in this case, maybe it's a positive. Now, I'm not saying that I would want to limit feed my heifers in, in my management system. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's just an interest, interesting observation that I've had. Um, you know, that's kind of what I'm talking about here is with, with high visit numbers and, and low fetch rate, that's all good from a robot labor standpoint. Um, but there could be some downsides in terms of other feeding behavior. So to talk through that example a little bit more, here are two, two animals, um, on the, one on the top, one on the bottom. And this is essentially their uh, visit and eating behavior for the first several weeks of lactation. So the, the cow on top here came from that limit fed heifer herd. So she calved in, they, these, both these animals calved in around the same couple of weeks. Um, so the top one calved in, you can see this light blue line here, that's the rumination minutes, because we have rumination monitors on the herd. The darker kind of teal line here, that's the total eating minutes. The black line is milk production, and then the blue and, and red bars down there, that's all her activity uh, monitor system. So 
So what you can kind of see here on this top cow is she came in, she kind of had some fairly sporadic eating and rumination behavior. Eating really was quite sporadic here for several weeks, you know, and you can tell she's kind of bouncing around a lot and her total rumination minutes also changes or, you know, bounces around quite a bit. And she averages around 500 minutes per day um, ruminating. So she kind of, you know, I'd say wouldn't have the easiest start when it comes down to her, her eating and rumination behavior. Um, especially when you compare it to the bottom cow here, you can see a much um, more steady eating behavior, a more a, a, an increase in rumination behavior and, and leveling out right around 700 minutes per day, 650 to 700. Um, and a more, you know, a better rise in milk and a better um, total level of milk production as well. You can see by 21 days here, she's up around 130 pounds um, or I guess kilos. I suppose I should have changed these uh, numbers over to, to metric, but so yeah, peaking at around 60 um, kilos within a few weeks. And so that's, that's good. She's off to a good start. Whereas this other cow, you know, here she's sitting early only probably around 40 kilos, um, even after a few weeks. So the cow on the top, like I said, that, that came from that limit fed herd, she has, she comes to the robot all the time. She comes and gets refused because her milk production isn't high enough to allow her to be milked more than three times per day. Um, but she came to the robot and would get refused 40 to 60 times a day during this early lactation period. And she just had that behavior that she really wanted to, to eat the pellet and clean up after any cows that left any um, feed in the feed bowls and really just had that, that sort of mentality to her, her eating behavior. And you can tell it didn't really do great things for rumination. She probably wasn't eating enough PMR at the bunk. She wasn't chewing enough and relaxing enough and, and, and ruminating enough, um, compared to that cow on the bottom that, that took right off and did well. You know, she had a pretty steady, um, milk visit type, um, behavior and, and she kind of just was a more mellow cow overall. Um, she was not limit fed as a heifer. So I think just kind of was an interesting lesson for me to kind of think about. And I wanted to share with you guys as well, that, you know, this types of behaviors are going to be evident in your herd, even under the same management, um, you know, that you, you may want to kind of consider, but there are downsides to everything. There's upsides to everything, right? So here possibly high refusals or high, high visits on those cows that were limit fed as heifers, but, you know, maybe they have a little bit rougher go at it from the start. Okay, so as we're talking about this, obviously that cow that's guarding the robot is slowing down the number of visits we get per day um, because obviously there wasn't a cow in the robot. So she was just making it so the robot was just sitting there empty, um, which gets me to my next point here, which is gonna be talking about time. So our most valuable resource, of course, is gonna be time. From a financial perspective, if we wanna put some numbers to it, the capital investment in robots, at least for us here, it's basically like paying for a very high tech parlor, you know, an equivalent cost there, plus five to seven years of labor. So if you took the parlor cost to milk 120 cows, plus five to seven years of labor, and then if you're borrowing money, pay interest on that labor. Um, that's kind of what it's equivalent to when we, when we buy these robots and put them into our, our herds. So um, we basically are incurring all that cost up front and it's, and it's there. Um, and obviously we can't cut a shift. We can't tell the robots to go home. Um, so I don't have to pay you <laughs> or anything like that. So we can't really decrease our milking cost, um, on the farm because the robots are going to be there anyway. The pro of course, though, is they're going to be there anyway. They show up for work and they don't require a visa if we're using, um, you know, immigrant labor or anything like that. Um, so, you know, that's a pro for us is that we didn't want to have to constantly try to find qualified help to show up and milk cows, especially at the size of a farm that we are. Um, it just, it's sometimes difficult to find someone to work such a part-time job. Um, so the major pro of course for that robot is that flexibility of time and that they're, that they're pretty much always there. Um, you know, as we go back to the numbers of it, of course, the higher financial efficiency for your system is going to be coming from pushing more milk harvested per unit time. So, you know, just like why we want maybe a little bit more milk per cow or milk per cow per day. Um, it's because at the end of the day, you know, we would like to generate a little bit more income per day, per, per year or whatever it might be. So in this case, we want to get more milk harvested per unit time. 
And the ways that we focus on doing that, and most um, you know, most robot herds probably do as well, is reduce free time on the robot. You just want to keep those robots full and milking, because as I said, you can't can't cut a milking shift in order to reduce your cost. Uh, we need to increase milk yield per minute of box time. So that just basically means when a cow comes in to milk, she should dump her milk quickly, or she should she should milk quickly and move on out so the next cow can get milked as well. Um, so what we're really looking for there is, is kind of keeping that milk speed up and maximizing milk speed so we can harvest more milk per unit of time or per day. And then of course, uh, increasing milk per cow. Um, I know there's a lot of different ways to think about these sort of things, but at the end of the day, um, increasing milk per cow is going to dilute the cost of maintenance for that cow. Um, it also means from a labor standpoint and a management standpoint, um, if I can have fewer cows making the same amount of milk as, you know, more cows making less milk, I have to touch fewer cows. I have to breed fewer cows. I have to calve in fewer cows. Um, so in that way, it makes it more financially efficient um, and time efficient uh, to reduce the number of cows I have if I only can make a certain amount of milk. And so that's why we would focus on increasing milk per cow. So in our case, because I only can have so many cows on the robot, I need to try to increase the amount of milk per cow or milk per cow per minute to uh, really keep my financial efficiency high. Now, talking a little bit about that free time side of things, um, this is something that is uh, pretty important. Obviously, free, free time to, to watch after. Um, the Lely Center here in the area kind of wants that 8 to 10% free time to allow for a little bit of time for timid cows to come up or to allow for the possibility of a robot breakdown or for normal maintenance um, without affecting cow behavior too much. Um, but one of the things that we kind of focus on a little bit is understanding what the cost of that free time is. Um, so that's what I'm going to run through here. If we are, as a farm are able to decrease our free time from 10 to 5%, I mean, that means we get 72 more minutes of milking time per day. And that basically for us is just about 10 more milkings per day. Um, on the two two robots, that's three more cows per robot. Is how many more cows I could put on um, to basically with that seventy two more minutes of free time. Uh, this would equate to us, you know, just increasing our milk sold per robot per day by about one hundred twenty five kilos. That's essentially fifty bucks per day, or fifty um, yeah, fifty dollars per day per robot. Um, increased revenue because we have more milks, more milk coming from the robots. So that's kind of where we start for our valuing of the free time. And so for us, that's going to be right around 18,250 um, for increased milk revenue per year with that reduction in free time. Now, of course, there's the downside of maybe you're going to have a few more fetch cows or maybe you're going to decrease visits a little bit. Um, but at the end of the day, if I try to keep my focus on milk harvested per robot per year, per minute, whatever it might be, um, then that's kind of where I want to maximize my, my robot um usage because that's going to be the, the most financially efficient um, obviously it's a balance you can't put 100 cows per robot with these style of robots um, and i venture to say that that's you know sometimes people maybe over promise on how many pounds of milk they can get out of a robot per day um the larger it comes down to the types of cows you're milking so that's kind of just something to kind of keep in mind there So looking at maximizing the, the number of minutes of milking per day, um, I can pull up a chart like this in our system. So essentially what this is, is the number of milkings we get per hour um, on the two robots. So the two different color bars are the two different robots. And then each hour is from midnight zero over here on the left side to 23, 24 over on the right side. So it's from midnight to midnight over a typical day. This is what our milkings break out to be. So if you just look at it as it sits now, you'd say, boy, there's a few opportunities to bring the milkings per hour up and maybe get a few more milkings. So I'll just start filling in what's going on in the barn at these different times. So the feeding time is at 6 a.m. in the morning, and then the fetch it also occurs at just before that time, and then again at 4 p.m. at night. So those two activities tend to de decrease the milkings per day or the visits per day because the cows are either you know, 
maybe preoccupied with the feed truck coming through, or I am in there making a change with the, the pen and, and disrupting the cows because I'm getting my fetch cows. Um, so that's, that's the reason for those two lower spots. The other two big ones, that's the wash. So that's when the robot washes. So we're not really gonna gain much time there. Um, we basically take the robots out of operation for 20 or so minutes. And that's what's causing the lower number of milkings at that time. So that's that's the main reason for those two. So what that leaves us with are two other low times right here and at the kind of three to five a.m. and then at the eleven to twelve, uh, you know, in the morning as well. So my suspicion is the three to five a.m. Like many robot herds, we see a dip in visits at this time. It's it's when cows are the quietest in the barn. It typically is when more most of the cows are taking their rest time. Um, if you look across a lot of different data sources, this tends to be um, the most common time for cows to get a few, you know, shut eye, shut eye in there. Um, and then that 11 to 12 a.m. in the morning, I've got a couple hypotheses on those uh, yeah, at, the, at that time. Um, one of them could be, that's oftentimes when I'm going through and doing any reproduction um, checks or doing uh, any other herd management things that tends to happen in that later morning hours. Uh, it also is a few hours after feeding. So if there are some cows, if there's a, a good group of cows that go to the feed bunk right after the morning feed is dropped, um, this would be the prime time for them to be sitting down, ruminating and not really wanting to go anywhere. So that's that's also a likely reason why we see a dip in visits at that time. Okay, so kind of giving you an overview of how our herd has has performed um, over the last year, just to kind of walk through it a little bit um, and set the stage for some of the larger changes we've made and, and how that's affected our um, data. Uh, that's kind of what we're talking through here. So. I know the, there's a lot going on in this chart. Um, this is coming out of the Lely system. So they like to show a lot of data and you have to kind of decode it as you go. So um, I'll kind of walk us through here, starting with what color lines are, are what they are. So the <clears throat> black line here is our days in milk. So this is how many you know, days we are into the milk of the average of the herd. And so you can see, we do have a little bit of a cyclic herd, meaning we, we have in quite a few cows in the late summer, early fall. Um, and so our days in milk, you can see, start to drop around that time as we bring in more fresh cows. Um, and kind of, we're right now somewhere around 150 days of milk. Um, that means during the summer, late spring, we tend to be pretty high days in milk on, you know, over 200 almost. Um, so this is something we hope to even out over time, but right now this is what we're dealing with. Uh, as such, you can kind of see what our milk production has done. Um, that's the bright red line here. Uh, our milk production, as we freshened in some more cows, has, has started to come up here um, in the last several months or in the last half a year. Um, so that's kind of, as you can see, what's going on there. Uh, the Let's see, what should we go to next? The milkings and refusals. So milkings are the blue bars or blue columns here and refusals are how many times the cows come to the robot but are turned away because they're not eligible to be milked yet. Um, and I bring these two up because it's interesting to see, you know, I was talking about that other herd that we bought that, uh, you know, the cows have a really high refusal rate. Well, there's a kind of a group of cows that all are around the same days in milk and have that same refusal rate, um, they all calved in around the same time as well, just because of the types of animals we bought. And they calved in in mid-June. And you can see what happened when they calved in. You know, our refusals spiked all of a sudden, and they kind of just kept staying up there. So um, we did experiment with trying to open up milk access a little bit to that group, but it really wasn't doing very much. I mean, they were already visiting plenty of times just allowing them more milkings was allowing more time to be tied up on the robots and it wasn't really gaining us much more uh, milk harvested per unit time. So uh, yeah, so that's just something that was interesting and, and showed up in our data here that I, you know, always kind of adds to the discussion, but trying to figure out if it's a meaningful difference is always a, a good uh, discussion to have with your consultants. Um, or if you are the consultant for a dairy, understanding what's happening um, over time. Because if you just take a, a short snapshot in, a, in one week period or a one month period, you might think there's something really wrong going on. Um, but the reality is that it's it's all kind of part of the system. So, 
diving into the nutrition side of things a little bit more here as we move into the second half of the presentation. Uh, this is our current ration or fairly close to our current ration. Um, we feed a corn silage and haylage diet. We have our own high moisture corn. Um, we also buy distillers, uh, dried distillers grains from a local plant. So that's a larger commodity that we have in place. And then we buy a lactating protein, which has uh, essentially quite a bit of soybean meal in it um, and a few other goodies. And then we do feed a, uh, this is a corn distiller solubles is what this syrup is here. Um, so it's a liquid feed. It's a pretty good ration conditioner. If, if anything, it helps just kind of bring the ration together and, and brings the, the dry matter down to help reduce sorting in that PMR. Um, and the cows really seem to like it. Um, so that provides a little, little bit of soluble protein as well. Um, but it really almost has uh, a decent amount of value just as a ration conditioner. Um, and then you can see our uh, fat source and uh, lactate mineral. And then these bottom two feeds, farm energy blend is really just ground corn with some amino acids. And then our gluten pellets um, that we buy in bulk here is on the bottom. So these bottom two are what are fed through the robot. Everything else is in the PMR. This is our somewhat current feed tables. Um, and it's you know, it's the feed table we're using right now. It's not necessarily what everyone needs to do. It seems to work fairly well for us. And there could be some changes that we need to make to it. Um, but right now, I, it's working fairly well. So the black line on top is the total amount of feed from the two different feed sources that we um, will offer in the robot. The uh, bright red line is the amount of corn gluten pellets. And the darker red line is the amount of that, that cornmeal or ground corn. Um, and you can kind of see how that changes over days in milk. Um, so what we do is once we get to around 100 days in milk, right, 100 days in milk, um, we kind of challenge them a little bit. We pull back quite a bit of the concentrate to basically try to see, you know, obviously they probably don't need that much, you know, as much concentrate as we would feed in early lactation. Um, and so we pull back both feeds at a roughly equal amount just to kind of um, try to see how those cows will do. And then um, at 200 days in milk is our next step. And so at that point, we pull quite a bit of the corn mix out and, and we kind of leave corn gluten pellets up a little bit higher. And that essentially lets us uh, reduce the amount of energy in the ration for those later lactation cows that really just don't need it. Um, and it also allows us to be getting our amino acids targeted towards that early end of lactation um, and not necessarily, you know, have a ton of rumen protected amino acids in those late lactation cows that are probably overfed on MP anyway. So um, then right before dry off, we cut back both pellet and uh, the farm mix pretty sharply just to um, help them transition off to that dry cow ration. Uh, this is kind of a snapshot of the herd performance uh, in the last month. Um, essentially this is kind of close to what you'd call a lactation graph in another herd management systems, um, but essentially just Kind of get an idea of, of how the herd performs and what i use it for as i'm trying to judge my feeding table and, and robot concentrate type um, um split is i i kind of go back and forth between the feed table and this kind of lactation output uh, to get an idea of if if my feeding method is is working okay or not and really the main one i'm looking at is understanding if when I cut back this uh, days in milk, or when I, sorry, when I cut back the speed offered at that hundred days in milk, I want to make sure I'm not really negatively affecting visits or uh, milk production of the herd at that time. And so you can kind of see here at hundred days in milk, my milk production kind of stays on the trajectory that it was on. Um, and you can see my visits here, which is the blue bars. My visits, there's no real big change in visits at that time. Um, so it indicates to me that it's not too sharp of a decline. Um, the cows are not really responding to that feed change in a negative manner. Um, and actually probably tells me that I could maybe even bump that back a little bit to maybe 80 days in milk or 75 days in milk, um, just because maybe I'm giving a little bit too much concentrate and I could move some of that uh, feed intake to the PMR a little bit sooner, um, just to kind of save on that concentrate costs. If I were feeding a much higher priced concentrate, that would definitely probably be a good move to do, um, at least in, in my experience here. Um, 
So that's that's something to kind of keep in mind. Now we can look back at the 200, oops, 200 days in milk drop here. And we can see at that time, there's also, we do see a drop in milk. You know, we do see a drop in visits at that time too. So this indicates to me, maybe there's some opportunity or to, to rethink some of that feed table um, in those animals, um, or perhaps also rethink the, the milk access tables, um, just to understand if I am making sure they can visit often enough, um, or if it's okay to be pinching them a little bit on, on visits because, you know, an animal that's making 75 or making uh, 30 kilos of milk, um, maybe she doesn't necessarily need to get milked more than two and a half times a day. Uh, so perhaps an area for opportunity to, to look at here to understand if my feeding tables or my milk access tables are limiting my cows in that later lactation. Now you can see after I cut them back that they kind of stay steady in milk and perhaps even climb a little bit. Um, so yeah, it should be some indicator to me that, well, maybe those animals don't necessarily, um, need the concentrate I'm offering, but just the change itself was enough to kind of throw them off for a few weeks. So, so that's, uh, typically what I do when I'm trying to evaluate, you know, my data, at least to, to understand what's going on. Um, and that's, uh, yeah, something that I think a, a consultant should often do is understand the system you're looking at, understand the whole picture um, to be able to make informed changes, um, not just using the same cookie cutter uh, um, ration across all herds or, or feed table across all herds. Okay, and what I'm going to share with you here is basically just the biggest change that we made from a feeding standpoint and how we judged that change over time to understand if it was a good change or not. Okay, so what we did is we made, maybe last January now, we decided to go away from a custom pelleted feed. Um, so one that I'd formulated that we had pelleted at a pellet mill and that was what we were feeding the robots was a custom pellet um, like many, many robot herds do. Uh, we went away from that and we went to uh, cornmeal and corn gluten feed pellets. So essentially what we're doing now um, where we just are feeding ground corn through the robots, ground mash, it's not pelleted at all. And corn gluten feed pellets, which is a uh, it's not a screened pellet. There are fines in the pellet as well. Um, so kind of goes against some of the things that we always talk about with feed pellet quality, but that's what we, you know, are feeding our, in our robot here. So uh, that change was made right around the 15th of uh, January. The top red line you can see here, this is uh, basically just the program feed. This is how much we had programmed through the feed tables. Um, I was making some changes at that point because we were uh, moving some bins around and stuff. So that's why you can see the program feed amount kind of bounces around a little bit. Um, but that that's kind of just more from a computer side of things. It's not what was actually being fed out to the cows um, at that time. Uh, the red line here is milk production. So you can see through that period from basically from uh, December to March, our milk production was staying pretty darn steady. And then on the bottom here is some of our visit behavior. So the dark blue bars are milkings and the uh, magenta colored bars are refusals. So that visits to the robot that wasn't milking. Um, and then the fat and, or sorry, the rumination is the, the teal line and the eating minutes is the other one. So it's a, a kind of darker teal. So what you can tell from this is that we made this change to our diets. It was a fairly large change, especially as it comes to what was being offered in the robot. And our milk stayed steady. Visit behavior changed only in the refusal side of things. So cows were coming to the robots more often. Our milking stayed steady because of the milk access tables. Um, and so to me, it was basically, well, this is a successful change. You know, we were able to keep milk steady without any other changes, you know, any significant changes to rumination or eating. Um, and because of the going away from the custom pellet, we dropped about 65 cents per cow per day, um, in feed cost. So I don't care how, we, how you might express that, but 65 cents per cow per day is quite a bit. Um, so we were able to save a considerable amount on feed cost, just going away from that custom pellet. And, uh, it worked in our system here. Um, it was a, a very good change for us. And with the two feeds, with the, the ground corn that we have on our farm, um, that we grow ourselves and the corn gluten pellets as a, as a commodity that we buy in bulk. Um, it was a very good economic decision for us. 
Now, how did we make this work? Because of course, one of the big things about robots is making sure you have good high quality pellets and, and minimal fines. And here I am telling you that I'm feeding basically a feed that is only fines. <laughs> Um, this is what we had to do to modify our system to make it work mechanically. So we had the drop tubes coming down from the, um, from the feeders and this drops, or sorry, from the, the feed bins and this drops down into the robot. So this picture is, is taken above, just above the robot. We had to install these, uh, basically it's a small vibrator that I have set up on a timer so that at every 15 minutes, it just gives that pipe a little shake for one second. And that's just enough to keep the feed flowing through the tube without bridging up. And so that's that was an important change we had to make for the ground corn aspect of it to make sure that that got all the way down to the robot fed into the bowl. The pellets here, you can see we have in a smooth walled tube, flex tube, um, to avoid any sort of bends and elbows where things could bridge up because they are a slightly larger pellet than some of the um, typical custom pellet formulations. Um, and so that's what kind of keeps that feed moving through the system as well. Now, all that being said, pellet quality is important. Um, I think that there's a, a big difference between ground feed, like what we're feeding, versus pellets that have a lot of fines. And the reason I say this is ground feed, like ground corn, is a very sweet and palatable feed to a cow. They don't really balk at the ground feed you know, they, they do eat it just fine. There's not a weird bitter taste. It's ground corn. Cows love ground corn. Uh, pellets with fines may be different. The pellets with fines, especially depending on what you have in your mix, may have bitter components and may have um, unpalatable components. And so that may be what puts cows off from, uh, you know, eating that feed in a timely manner. Generally, we see fines reduce intake rate and increase feed refusal. That's what we know from, from a lot of robot systems. Um, unpalatable plus those fines, basically what I'm saying here is that uh, that that tends to reduce visits and increase feed waste. When we have fines building up in the bowl, that's where we lead. That's what really kind of is a downward spiral in terms of feed quality and uh, visit uh, frequency in a, in a free flow herd. Now, I will say that what we're doing with the ground feed Cows did need a little bit of time to adjust. They did need to figure out how to physically eat the feed, you know, a, a different from the pellet. Um, you know, you kind of saw cows leaving a little bit more in the bowls for the first couple of days, but then they did figure it out. Um, and that's kind of, here's some data to kind of back that up, that uh, if you look at the pellet density index for PDI um, and some of these uh, robot herd type studies, um, you can see that better pellets do lead to more visits and more milkings. Um, so that's kind of what I'm sharing here is that, that, you know, even though, yes, I'm saying we feed ground feed, there are some um, things we still have to keep in mind when we're talking about uh, feeding a custom pellet. Now, bringing it down to the time for feeding. Um, so the most valuable resource, again, being time, but this is specifically in a feeding side of things. We really can't push ground feeds too far. So this would be like my situation here where I'm feeding a ground corn. I don't wanna push those ground feeds too much. And, and why is that? Well, time. The time it takes to eat a ground feed is much different than the time it takes to eat an equivalent amount of pellet. So I'll give you an idea here. So early lactation cows, let's say they're making 48 kilos, 4X milking with an average box time of seven minutes. This will give us around 28 minutes per day to eat the feed at 400 grams per minute of feed intake, which is what can be achieved on a pellet system. Um, that's a maximum of 11 kilos of feed per day. Okay, so that's kind of the maximum they would be able to eat if they were eating when they were in the robot the entire time. Pellet feed has increased bulk density. That's why we pellet feeds in, in commercial applications this is because it has an increased bulk density so you can ship more in the same amount of space. Now that's what's allowing us to, to achieve higher dry matter intake per minute. A typical pellet eating rate is gonna be between two and 300. High producing cows or, or more aggressive cows can push 450 grams per minute. Um, and so that's just kind of what they've seen some, some, from some different studies on, on eating rates. Ground feed is a lower end of the spectrum that tends to be maybe 200, for me, it's around 250 grams per minute. Um, it seems to be the max that I can push through the robots before I start having feed build up. Uh, so really, you know, you gotta think 
200 grams per minute is probably the the realistic um, or practical maximum that you may want to consider with uh, ground feed. So as an example of this, <laughs> I ran out of pellet over Thanksgiving week in 2020. I tried to push the ground, at the time I had a ground um, corn, soybean meal in distillers in the mix as well. I tried to push that to kind of get me through to when I could get my next pellet delivered. Um, really cows could, cows could manage about five kilos of feed per day through the robot. That was it um, before they really started building up in the bowls. So I kind of learned my lesson the hard way where I had to make sure that I wasn't putting too much ground feed to the cows because they just didn't have the time to eat it. And so that's where my kind of rule of thumb comes from is no more than five kilos of ground feed, max of nine for any individual cow. So those high producers that have more milkings per day, they can, they can eat a little bit more, but uh, for the average on the herd average, I don't push more than five kilos in, in my situation here. And then the rest of it should come from a pelleted feed of some sort. If you're feeding more than five kilos of, of feed in the robot, you're going to need to have probably coming from some sort of a pelleted feed in some way. So when we're looking at those uh, feeds that go into pellets or feeds that go into the robot, um, we really want to focus on palatability. And so this is kind of just a chart here to give you an idea of which corns tend or which uh, feeds tend to be higher or lower palatability. Um, so typically, if you're building a custom pellet, you will want to choose from the high to moderate palatability types and have minimal amounts of the low palatability uh, feeds in there. I think this is sometimes a challenge. A lot of people will try to be balancing their robot pellet to have, you know, some extra fancy minerals in there or some extra, you know, additives in those pellets. Well, we really have to try to understand what that means for palatability and if that alone could be turning um, animals away from the pellet itself. Um, so something to kind of keep in mind. Now, as we get more into the nutrition side of things, uh, that's what we're trying to balance here. So one of the things that is incredibly important in any herd, but especially when you're trying to feed feeds separately of each other in a, T in a PMR or concentrate system is understanding what they're bringing to the table. So like on this chart here, what I've got is just simply the 12 hour NDFD. So the digestibility of that NDF in a 12 hour in vitro system versus the UNDF or the unavailable NDF. You can see some feeds have very high 12 hour NDF and very low UNDF while others are sort of a balance of the two. And these are ranked actually by their 12 hour NDF. So it tends to be that as you get to a lower 12 hour NDF, you have higher UNDF, but that's not necessarily the case with all feeds where there are more balanced feeds. So if you're trying to use the pellet to bring in the concentrate to bring in a little bit more uh, fiber source for the cows, if you're trying to stretch out some sort of a, a forage inventory issue or whatever that might be, um, that's where you'll want to try to focus on the uh, NDFD um, and the, the UNDF coming from those feeds. Okay, so as we continue talking about that managing diet structure in our robot herds, uh, we need to do everything that we know for maintaining good diet structure, meaning PENDF, PEUNDF, um, everything that we kind of know about trying to maintain good rumination and eating behavior, that's really going to be the key for getting these, uh, these diets to work. Um, so kind of stepping through that now for the last few slides. Uh, early lactation cows with higher concentrate allowances, they tend to have a higher risk for lower rumination. Okay, so that's basically what we already know, but as animals that are fed higher amounts of concentrate um, eat that concentrate, they're gonna have less rumination if they aren't maintaining good intake of fibrous or forage particles. And so anything we can do to encourage that PMR intake while maintaining visits, that really should be the focus. And so in those areas, intake management, don't let cows run out of feed and work to control sorting and focus on that physical diet structure. So I'm gonna dive into a few slides next um, that come from uh, kind of understanding what we need to for diet structure. And what do I mean by diet structure? Well, this picture here is a, a picture that I took on a farm up in Canada actually. Uh, so basically it's, uh, uh, this is being fed to bred heifers. So it's a, a diet that has typically a lot of diet structure. If you look close at the feed bunk, you can see there's plenty of sticks and twigs and rocks. Um, 
that's not the diet structure we're looking for, but we also understand that sometimes that happens. Uh, but one of the things you have to always understand that when you're feeding a diet like this, there's not only the propensity to, um, have sorting, which you can see sorting out those sticks and rocks, but you can see that actually there's probably some other sorting going on where there's a lot of feed down here and not a lot of feed here. This is probably related to the fact that the mixer wagon wasn't really doing a great job of mixing and processing this long stem, um, forage. And that was leading actually to quite a few of the fines and the, the, you know, more energy dense parts of the diet coming out in the bottom or in the later half of this feed drop. And so that's where uh, a lot of the cows were eating first, and then they would go down and eventually try to sort through and eat uh, the more fibrous part of the diet. So it's, uh, it's always something we have to keep an eye on um, to try to really get ahead of sorting because any, any ration we put together with the perfect PENDF or PEUNDF or whatever numbers that are we're looking at, uh, that can be ruined by implementation pretty quick. Um, so that, that physical form of the diet is very important. Um, keeping an eye on effective fiber, UNDF, um, PENDF, et cetera, and cup length and particle size is really what we need to do. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly here about what sort of measurements we could use. Uh, UNDF or PENDF or PEUNDF. You know, there's all sorts of different uh, measures out there now, and they're kind of growing by the day. Um, but I'll kind of walk you through what I've done with my herd a little bit and then um, what I think works for a lot of people um, to help manage those numbers. So PEUNDF, the physically effective UNDF, is something that's kind of come around more in the last few years as a possibility of something that we need to be looking at fairly close. And so, you know, my takeaway is that yes, from the data we've seen, there's a lot of good data out of minor institutes um, that kind of helps lay this out. I'm gonna actually show a couple of slides related to that um, here soon. Um, but basically we wanna keep that physical structure in mind every time we formulate diets. It's easy just to look at something like PENDF and say, oh, we're good, or total NDF or whatever it might be. Um, but really we need to understand what that looks like in the feed bunk and um, if the cows are gonna have something that they can ruminate on effectively. Um, basically what this leads to is if we're not looking at those things, uh, we can see some hot diets that will work. I mean, hot meaning a highly digestible starch type diet. Um, they'll work where we don't expect them to. And then in other times we'll feed a safe diet with, you know, lower digestible starch or lower uh, starch levels and high fiber levels. And yet we'll still see some acidosis type issues. Um, a lot of this, I think, relates to the fact that that physical structure of the final diet doesn't necessarily relate or doesn't necessarily um, show up on the, the formulation program when we're going. So in my diets, I'm currently targeting between five and 5.5% 5 .5 PEUNDF as a kind of dry matter. Um, that tends to be where my cows seem the happiest from a rumination standpoint. Um, and as long as I can get that mixed well, uh, it seems to work, work fairly well. Uh, I still recommend that these are going to be herd specific goals. So you will find that some herds will be able to manage lower than this. You'll be able to find that some need to manage higher than this for PEUNDF. Um, but really what this is most useful for me is when I'm changing to a new forage or I'm changing something significant about the forage portion of my diet, I need to try to maintain small changes in PEUNDF. So if I'm opening up a new bunk of corn silage and I see that I am lowering my PEUNDF um, because of a different uh, amount of, of NDF in the, in the forage or a different amount of uh, digestibility, uh, then I could try to anticipate the changes that my cows may see. So if I see a decrease in intake or an increase in intake, it oftentimes does relate to what that change in PEUNDF may be. And lastly, we have to understand the, the kind of the whole picture here is that ingestion and rumination will change the way the formulated diet actually works in the cow. Um, so while we may be able to do a Penn State shaker box for the ideal particle size distribution, um, cows will change what's going on once they eat it, um, usually for their benefit. Um, that's how they're designed. So uh, we have to remind, remember that they're always designed to be a ruminant, to, to ruminate and chew their food. Um, so this is what's actually kind of cool. I pulled out some uh, data from Minor Institute. So a couple of the next few slides are all from Rick Grant and his slides looking at PEUNDF and, and the relationships uh, with the cow. 
I just thought these these slides that I pulled out here were just really cool to look at. So I pulled a couple and hopefully all the um, attribution is correct to him um, and minor institute. So uh, in this particular study, what they looked at is understanding the change in particle size associated with eating and uh, rumination. So in this case, what they were doing is they were feeding diets of, of different types of particles or different types of feeds. Uh, they emptied the rumen and, and caught the bolus as it came down into the rumen and then did a, a particle size analysis on those boluses. And so this is basically just to understand how much particle size reduction occurs only due to chewing while eating. So not even the rumination aspect, but just the, the first time the cow gets a go at that, uh, that feed, what does it do for particle size? So it's really fascinating data because I mean, it's, it's just really neat to see what the cows are able to do in such a short amount of time as, as eating. Um, so basically what we can look at here is the diet is on the top part. So this is what the diet would be before the cow touches it. And then the bolus is what it is after the cow eats it, after she swallows it that first time. So before any rumination, just the physical process of eating. And look at these long particles. This the sieve size here is, is the long particles on the left-hand side and going down to the smaller particles. She's able to take this diet that has 27% of the particles here on the 13.2 millimeter speed. So we're talking about, I mean, this is 20 to 30, sometimes even a little bit more, 20 to 30 to 40% of the diet has a long, longer particle. And she reduces that down rapidly down to, I mean, doing the math here, less than 15% of the diet. So just that eating process really breaks down the large particles fairly rapidly. And look at how consistently she takes these diets down to 11% as that, that long particle. You know, and these are actually quite different diets. You know, some of these diets have uh, very, very long particles here, 32% as, as 19 millimeters or more um, versus a 9% as 19 millimeters or more. But once it came down to the bolus, that didn't matter. She got it down to less than 13.2 millimeters and, you know, quite rapidly, just in that eating process. And if you look at the mean particle size, you know, it also shows the same over here where the diet has, uh, has different mean particle sizes based on the PENDF content of, of the um, study diets here, you know, nine versus 10 uh, mean particle size, but she gets them down to a remarkably similar seven to so seven and a half to eight uh, mean particle size in the bolus. So the cow is doing exactly what she's designed to do is to manage that long forage, that, um, that, that initial feed coming in as being a long forage and bringing it down to a more manageable uh, particle size. So I thought it was really cool data to see because it's a very rare thing for people to actually be analyzing the bolus alone. Um, so it was pretty, pretty neat to, to have presented. This is kind of showing a similar thing here. Um, and I think maybe for the interpretation of this, it'd be best to, to let Rick do it in his own presentation. Back uh, a little ways ago, he was a nutritionist presentation is where this came from. So um, yeah, it's, it's again, kind of showing that same thing that it, they will take uh, many different types of feed and be able to break that down to pretty much the bolus size or the, or the meat particle size that she wants um, to really start that rumination process and, and get that that process going. Um, so yeah, it's really fascinating that I encourage you to look back at his presentation um, to really understand uh, what they were able to do and what they were able to measure. So. Okay, now talking a little bit about microbial colonization and how that plays into the chewing and rumination point. Um, because basically the question we kind of have once the animal starts to eat that feed is how fast do the microbes start to degrade the feed? And so this is some really cool work out of uh, Japan here on the left-hand side of how fast do the cells actually colonize and start digesting the, uh, the feed once it's introduced to the rumen. So these are samples that were just put in polyester bags and put in the rumen. So they didn't have any chewing or rumination exposed to them. Um, but you can see that within a couple hours, they pretty much reach what they're going to from a, a um, cell colonization standpoint. So they, they very rapidly colonize. I mean, quite a, you know, we're talking about almost, 
uh, log cell equivalents, but we, we can see that they, they reach a very high level of colonization within that first two hours. And then anything after that is really just a uh, slower rate because of the slower rate of degradation of that uh, longer lived particle or longer lived uh, fiber in the rumen. On the right hand side, it's a little bit shorter time frame. You, here you can see basically the same idea that within 30 minutes, we start to reach a plateau on colonization of that fiber um, in unruminated feeds. So microbes are very good at attaching to feed very quickly. It's kind of what the take home here is that. Um, there's not really much of a lag phase for those for those microbes to really um, start degrading the, the fiber. Now, just keep in mind that this has no effect of rumination. And so we know that rumination obviously is going to change um, the colonization rate pretty drastically. And that's kind of what's being shown here. Uh, so what they were doing in these studies is they were trying to understand the uh, effect of chewing and rumination in colonization by microbial communities. And so we have uh, uh, several different methods used to understand that colonization. So um, we have kind of more of a protozole marker, we have a fun fungal marker, and then a bacterial marker to kind of see what happens when we take a feed that has been simply ground through a one centimeter screen, ground through a one centimeter screen and allowed to be chewed by the animal ground through a one centimeter screen, chewed, and then ground again to try to simulate a more aggressive breakdown, and then exposed to sodium hydroxide. So as we know, some feeds are exposed to hydro sodium hydroxide to try to aid in the breaking apart of that fiber. Um, and so this is to kind of show what happens to the colonization of different species across those different types of, uh, of processing. So essentially what they were trying to do is simulate uh, chewing and rumination in, in these, um, sorry, in these experiments. So what's interesting to me or what my big take home from this, this study basically was is that that chewing process greatly increases or, or significantly increases the colonization of, of fungal and bacterial populations um, when you compare it just to a non-chewed particle. So two particles of the same size when they are introduced, that chewing process increases the rate of colonization, or increases the amount of colonization over a given amount of time. The regrinding process or reducing particle size also can greatly increase the amount of uh, colonization of bacteria on these um, plant fibers, um, but it had a minimal effect on some of the other populations such as protozoa and uh, fungi. And these are the references for this study. A really, really interesting study to look at uh, if you're interested in the microbial colonization of, of uh, feeds and ruminants. Okay, so kind of taking home my key points. On-farm reality, of course, will always make or break our perfectly formulated ration. Um, and you have to remember that that's never the final diet. The one we print off on the piece of paper is never what actually finally gets to the cow. Um, we always have to feed tight to that expected intake to try to um, understand how the cows are eating so that we can avoid that yo-yo effect. Um, essentially what I mean by that is when we feed to let's say 10 or 12 percent refusals, we actually never really get a good understanding of if they're eating the entire diet or just the goodies, just the good part of the diet and sorting out all the fiber. Um, so if we feed a little bit tighter to expected intake, this will allow us to maintain a more uh, constant amount of feed in front of the animals and uh, maintain good rumination behaviors. Use those guidelines that we have for PENDF and UNDF and PEUNDF as needed, but always let the cow have the final say. A lot of the times the cow's interaction with the diet will tell us a lot more about how she's perceiving the diet than what we can tell on paper. So here's a, I'll show you this video that I have of, of a cow eating her diet and you can see the cow is doing exactly what she's designed to do, which is figure out how to sort out, find the best pieces of feed. So she's moving it around with her nose and then eating up all the grain. <laughs> so I know you've seen this a lot on different farms, um, but it's always something to kind of watch and keep an eye on. Okay, 
kind of wrapping up here, this was uh, basically a diet that was optimized using AMTS and fed through a vector system. So when we talk about robots and robot feeding even, um, understand that this is what right, technology would say is the best situation where you're feeding using a modern ration balancing program and optimized according to you know, economic principles and then fed through a vector which is going to always give the freshest feed, perfectly mixed, et cetera, whatever the companies are going to tell you. Um, well, the cow's reality here is a little bit different than what we um, maybe expect when we uh, invest in these sort of systems. So what you can see on the left-hand side is the uh, manure at this farm, um, where basically we have cows that obviously are getting plenty of digestible fiber, and cows that are maybe not getting as much digestible fiber and not as much uh, fiber to ruminate. And so these two cow patties in the same pen um, kind of indicate to us that, okay, there's definitely two different diets being fed here, even though it's the same diet on paper. On the right hand side is a picture of the feed bunk. So what was going on here basically is that the, the feed was being mixed very well in the vector system. Um, and a lot of the concentrates were coming out at a different time as the rest of the diet. And so the cows ate up all the concentrates and, and ate up all the feed here on the close side, and then more of the fibrous particles are left down on the far side. So plenty of sorting occurring in this situation. Um, and I'm not saying that the vector system is the, is the culprit here, but it really is just they needed to change some of their mixing times and their pre-processing of feeds to be to allow that system to work well. Um, so it's always something you know to keep in mind that we have to understand the whole picture and we have to know that even though on paper or even though the engineers would say this should work great, it might not always work so great. So finally, my take home messages are gonna be this. Don't be afraid to take any, to take, to try something new. Um, you know, for us, it was changing away from a pelleted feed and going to ground feed, homegrown feed in a, in a bulk commodity. Um, always challenge those preconceived formulation dogmas. So basically, you know, if you have a certain crude protein level that you always want to target, well, that's not necessarily something that the cows really care about. So be free or feel free to challenge those and see how the cows respond. Don't always just listen to one source of information. Um, and what I mean by this is that if we only went by what an engineer would say, or only went by what one you know consultant would say, we might not have the right information to actually do a good job balancing for the herd. Um, so always look for diverse opinions um, and, and use that to your advantage as you're formulating diets, as you're consulting with the farm. And then on the other side of things, you always have to remember to do the basics very well. So if you're trying something new and challenging dogmas and all that sort of thing, you better make sure you're doing a good job of routinely measuring trimatter. You know, something as simple as that, we still don't necessarily do on a routine basis, um, at least not as well as we should. So those things for me, of course, are gonna be manure observations, basically how are the cows responding to my diet? So walking pens, looking at cows, looking at manure, um, doing those routine dry matter adjustments, and then the routine feed and forage testing that's required to really understand how those feeds might change over time. Taking those measurements and managing the variation, you can't measure or you can't manage what you can't measure or what you don't measure. So always <laughs> keep that in mind um, that you may have an idea of what's going on, but if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. And then focus intensely on cow behavior. That's kind of been our mantra here is let the cows tell us what's going on. Um, if you have a good, keen understanding of your herd, they'll tell you pretty quick. Now, I know that's not something that's always available when you're a consultant that's only coming by every few weeks or once a month or more. Uh, if you have the opportunity to really have a good person focusing on cow behavior and feeding that information back to you as a consultant, that can be a tremendous help to help move a herd to re reach their goals. And so with that, I will take any questions and I also want to thank everyone for sticking with us through this. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, just feel free to, to ask them now or reach out to me later. So thank you.
Before we get to the question and answer period, I have a few people to thank. Firstly, thank you, Sam. I know it was not easy for you to find time to fit in the work that you have obviously put into this presentation. I'm sure thanks are also due to your partners and family for your time away whilst doing this. The webinars are organized and produced by AMTS, USA and Global. I am grateful for the support of all my team, especially Tom, who can be persuaded to join to ask smart questions, and Lynn, who joins with the promise I will not ask her to talk unless circumstances are dire and my internet dumps me. She feeds me questions she gets from you out there while you contact support. I am honored to have a terrific group of co-hosts share the task of asking useful and thoughtful questions, as well as giving gl valuable global aspect to our webinars. Through this year, we have been regularly joined by Dr. Elena Bonfante, AMTS Italian distributor and partner in dairy innovations with Dr. Bill Prokop, who often also joins. We welcomed our distributor in Turkey, Dr. Huday Kavustran of Zerv, our Russian distributor and director of Novolav, Dr. V Vadim Bakchevnikov, our distributor in China, Dr. Sean Lee of Ansi Tech, and Marcos Hens Ramos, distributor in Brazil, all joined us periodically through the year. Dr. Marcos Neves Piera of the University of Lavras in Brazil has also often joined with excellent insights and questions. The hardest working team in this series is Dr. Paula Gerillo of Afina, who hosts a series as El Webinar del Nutritionista, supported by Biotur, Technal, Concar, Philbro, Nutrifeed, Guermo Lerman, and Rock River Lab in Argentina, and her excellent Spanish translator of Paula Alanis. I can count on them every time. We are especially thankful to generous sponsors who make it possible for us to get great speakers and manage the program. We thank our gold sponsors, Arm & Hammer Animal and Food Production, hashtag Science Hearted, the Canola Council of Canada. Learn more about feeding canola at canolaamazing.com. Adina, experts in animal nutrition with expertise in plant bioactives. And Proteca, transforming the future of farm animal health. Our silver sponsors are Ajinomoto, superior nutrition through amino acids, and Virtus, both of whom have sponsored us from the start. Also, the Forage Analysis Labs of Dairyland Laboratories and Dairy One, both with affiliates around the world. Adiseo, Rumen and Nutrition Solutions to ensure animal performance, and Micronutrients. We, by we I mean I. I failed to record the afternoon question session. Apparently, my brain took a vacation. But those questions were very similar to those of the morning session, so you're not really missing much in context by not having that recorded session. Thank you again for joining us through this year, and I hope that you, as I do, look forward to next year where we will feature webinars that will focus on emissions and excretions, issues that are going to become more and more important in our industry. So I look forward to talking to you again next year. Enjoy the question period. If you would, everybody say hello, open up your mics. And um, this morning we have um, Bill Prokop, Hudai Kavustran, and Sean Lee with us, as well as Lynn, but she's not going to talk. Um, so, and Sam, thanks for, for coming. All right, so let's change. Okay, Sam's here. Just, I guess I'll pop right in, make sure everyone can hear me. Morning, Sam. This is Bill. Hi, Bill. I have a, Hello, I have a this is Hudai from Turkey. Hi, Hudai. Hi. Okay. okay. Um, let's see. I have some questions, but um, it sounded like Bill had something he wanted to start right off with. So I do see a couple questions over in the, yeah. the um, questions yeah. chat, too. So. so I wanted to say I had a question for Lynn, but I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I, first of all, Sam, great presentation, um, as always, and I really <laughs> applaud um, your intention here of, of, of helping to quantify what I call the critical to quality factors on dairies. 
as we learn to develop system management systems to optimize production by letting a cow be a cow. Okay. And, and I think that's really where the future of our industry is going from a consumer stand approval standpoint. And just from the fact it's the right thing to do. And it's also the most profitable thing to do. So kudos on that. Um, can, is my mic working? I just want to check. Is this? Yeah, point? you're doing great. <laughs> okay, good. So uh, I have a, a, a myriad of questions, but I'll, I'll do that offline at some point. But I'm just curious because the use of scales is something, you know, that's obviously underutilized um, because dairies don't see the value of the investment or it didn't work into the management scheme, the flow. Since you have one, at what intervals are you using the scale to monitor body weight changes in your management system? I assume like freshening and dry off, or do you use it at other intervention points to decide how to change the diet energy-wise if you feel that body weight accretion isn't what it should be or is too much or whatever? So go with that. Yeah, um, thanks for the question, Bill. It's, it's a good one. Uh, being a year in here, I'm, I'm still finding my sweet spot, I'd say. And right now my, my weights are taken on an opportunistic basis. Uh, so I calve every cow in through that scale or well, after they're calved in, they come in that pen and I get a weight on them as I do the pre-processing before going into the robot. Uh, so I have that, what I would consider one of the most critical ones of, of right after freshening, you know, what is the, the body weight of that cow? Um, Cause that gives me a good idea of her essentially your frame size, you know, it, um, that's probably our most accurate time to take that measurement. Uh, when we do breedings, I try to breed most animals. If I'm breeding only one or two animals, I do try to breed them in there. So I get that, uh, that weight, you know, somewhere around 60 to 80 days on a first breeding and uh, 50, 50 to 80 days, probably on a first breeding. And then on subsequent breedings after that, if, if they are coming into the scale, I'll, I'll get them at that point too. Um, so that kind of over time, I've been able to build up my, my database of, okay, how much do they lose in that first, you know, you know, a couple months of lactation. And if it seems out of whack or, you know, at this point, it's really more so just getting that feel of, okay, animals are dropping a half a condition score, which tends to be about my average at, that, at this point. Um, if they're losing more than that, I try to understand if that's a problem or not. Um, you know, normal body weight movement is going to happen. And even if they're losing up to a condition score, I'm fine with that as long as they're milking well. Um, if they're not milking well, then obviously there's something different going on. I use that information in my robot formulation tool itself. Uh, so unfortunately, I didn't really get to it in this presentation today, just from a time standpoint, I decided not to go actually into the model to show the, the new robot tool. Um, it's kind of in our early phases here. But in that tool, we put in the body weight and body, no, not body weight, sorry, the body condition change. Um, and that helps me understand a little bit about how rapidly that occurs and when it starts to recover. Um, so I'm kind of using those breeding weights to, to help me understand that curve. Um, Long-term, hopefully this will all benefit you guys as well because it's what I'm gonna use to help seed my, my model um, within the tool so that you don't have to manually enter in body condition score change. We can kind of use some of the, well, there's, there's definitely existing models out there, but I always like to run them against um, real data and, and uh, test them out and make sure it's gonna work for the CNCPS. So um, yeah, that's, that's kind of how I use that. And then the, the last point, I, I do dry off some cows through that scale. So I kind of get a dry off weight. Um, it's, I don't have as many of those weights and I don't necessarily use it as often. I, I use more body condition score at dry off to understand if I've um, added enough condition back and then try to maintain uh, a level, you know, no, no add or subtract in body condition through that uh, dry period. So uh, yeah, kind of long-winded answer, but that's, that's how I'm using it right now. Well, you're um, mature, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to point out to those of you who are using the program, Sam did do a video when we first released that, that um, illustrates the use of the tracking of the body weight condition score. So I'll shoot out a link to that video when I send the availability of the recording. And I just want to follow up with, so as your herd develops a mature body weight size, right, when you have older cows eventually, 
Will you be using the scale um, in formulation for um, average daily gain, you know, with actual weight targets, having that data available? Um, I'm just curious. Yeah, I'm currently using, I'm using the mature weight of, of what I've got on some of my herds. I've actually split it between the herds at this point because I do have, I have one herd that was a larger, more TPI type herd. Um, and they have a probably 20 to 30 kilo larger mature body weight on, on the mature cows I have there. Uh, so I am kind of looking at those a little bit separately, um, but it's, it's such a small number of cows at this point. It's probably not all that useful to me. It's just playing with data. Um, but I, I do use that input um, to, to help me get my right input for the model. Uh, and then that's been helpful for me because it just, it takes the guesswork out. It's, I don't have to spend time thinking, boy, I think they're a little bit more, you know, a little bit larger than average or a little less, you know, large than average or whatever. Um, I have the number, I just plug it in and keep going. Um, and then use the target system within the model to help me uh, smooth between the points, I guess you could say. Okay, thank you. Hi, thank, thank you, Bill. Um, I have a number of questions and I would like to offer an opportunity for both Hudai and Sean to speak. I'm gonna just pepper in a question really quick and then um, Hudai, I will come back to you. Um, the question okay. I'm going to ask actually combines a, a question from Sean Lee and one from one of our attendees. Um, it's, can, Sam, can you give a brief, some comments on the reproductive performance, um, heat detection, pregnancy rate, calving time, et cetera, with the help of all the automated sensors on your robot dairy and in conjunction with that, does Laley estimate rumination? How does Laley estimate rumination time? Is it through the collars? Yeah, so we do have uh, um, activity monitor, the collars uh, does, does have activity on there too. So I am, um, we currently use a, a pre-sync ob-sync setup. So we're not double ob-sync, we're just uh, pre-sync ob-sync. So it's a uh, two loop shots and then going into ob-sync for anyone that we do cherry pick off the second loop um to any cows that come into heat after that voluntary wait period um and that's based off of the activity in the system uh in Laley's system i tend at this point i'm kind of tending to try to get my breeding in this later half of the window um and that has seemed to work okay for us uh we initially started out using conventional semen just to kind of get a feel of, of how our repro was going to be um we were had good enough conception rates that we said, okay, let's switch to beef and sex. Uh, I, there was more of a drop on that than I thought on, on sex semen. Um, I, we're still kind of working through some of it, trying to figure out if it's, if it's me or if it's something else in the timing or what it might be. But, um, yeah, so, so we use activity largely. Um, and then of course the visual walking the barn twice a day. Um, I do catch a cow in heat before the system does every once in a while. I'll just know, okay, she's acting funny. She's not in her normal spot. She's running around, whatever it might be. And I'll, I'll see it before the system does. And uh, yeah, I kind of just make a note. So that visual part is pretty important to, to back up the, the data. Um, if you spent all the time in front of the computer, I, I have a feeling you'd have a lot of issues um, because you have, to, you have to look at the cows. You have to still get that feel of how they're doing by walking them. Um, we also use the, the collars on heifers too. I, I try to get the collars on a few weeks before um, their, their kind of repro window starts. Um, so I do use it on those animals. And that's actually helped a lot because the heifers aren't necessarily always watched, you know, at a very specific time. We try to watch them each end of the day, but uh, the collars have definitely helped pick those up a little bit uh, more accurately. Sam, do you use the Laley um, generated activity values in the program, in the model where it's um, asking for a flat distance walked or are no, you trying no, to- No, we don't, they're not pedometers. Um, we don't have that sort of thing. And there's, people have looked at trying to understand stride length and, and putting steps to flat distance walked um, or, or putting basically just to get that activity number. Uh, it's not, I don't, I wouldn't spend my time chasing that too much for an input into the model because yes, flat distance walk can have a large effect if we're talking about the extremes. Um, 
you know, and making sure we're not just using the default. But right at this point, I don't think it's worth going out trying to find, okay, this cow worked, this cow walked uh, 2,000 meters and this one walked 2,500 meters. What am I going to do? Yeah, just realistically, yeah. it's not really a, a thing you have to look at. But. Okay. Um, we'll come back to, to some of the other questions. Hudai, thank you for joining us. Um, yeah. Do you have some questions? Yeah, I have some questions. <clears throat> Thanks, Sam. It was a really uh, excellent presentation. Well, thank you, Guy. Uh, we are more familiar about the uh, robotic milking now. <laughs> so I have some question here. First of all, I'd like to ask that, uh, if, is it true that the robotic milking require more mental work rather than uh, physical work? Is that correct? Um. There's, there's plenty of mental work. Um, I probably overthink a lot of things, just my tendency. Um, that, <laughs> that happens, of course. There's still plenty of physical work. I mean, I, you know, I'm going through the pen each day and cleaning out the stalls and clean platforms. Um, and then the rest of the farm had, you know, it's a, we're a working dairy and, you know, field cop operation. So there's plenty of physical work in that way. I guess the, you know, like what all the marketing stuff says, there is flexibility and that allow that allows a little bit more, I guess I'd say better mental health in terms of the, the workload and whatnot. Mm. You know, you're not tied down to a certain milking time. I do try to vary my fetch times here and there just to keep the cows guessing so I don't get any uh, lazy cows that, you know, just say, ah, I'll wait till he comes around. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, there, there's plenty of data to look at. I wish it was easier to pull out because I have some very specific questions um, that the system might not be all that well uh, designed to to tell me. Um, so there, yeah, there's there's plenty of I mean plenty of both. I'd say. Yeah. So the uh, my other question is that <laughs> I'm really curious if there is any other special requirements, especially for the milk pickup. You know, you are making 24 hours a day. Compared to the other parlor system, two weeks or three weeks milking time. So when you finish the milking, uh, I think you collect all the milk in the tank and you need a certain period of time to cool down the milk. So how, how do you manage this uh, milk pickup? You know, yes. uh, milking 24 hours a day. Yeah, so on a farm our size, on a conventional dairy where it was a parlor or, or you know, a tie stall or any sort of operation like that where you do have downtime in the, in the parlor, um, that gives you your time to wash. And it also at, at milk pickup, you try to time it when you're not milking so that you can wash the tank and get that washed before the next, uh, next milking. Uh, what we have to do here, um, so that we can milk 24 hours a day is we have a buffer tank, um, that allows us to channel the milk that direction while the tank is being emptied and washed. the main tank is being emptied and washed. Uh, and that allows us to maintain 24 hour milking um, with, with no disruption based on milk pickup time. Uh, you know, that's something you typically find on a larger dairy, you know, 120 cows, you wouldn't normally have that, but we do because of that, uh, that aspect. So yeah, there's an expense to it, of course, but uh, for us to keep that extra hour going, that's worth it. So. Yeah, what's the capacity of your buffer tank? I think we are maybe um, 300 gallon. It, it, we don't get it anywhere near full on these two cows or on these two robots. Um, but yeah, it would hold yeah. plenty of plenty of uh, buffer. So, okay. so the, my last question is about the uh, the rear teeth. If they are close to each other, so does it create a problem for milking? Uh, with the A5s, what we've got, I, I don't actually see that many problems with the rear teats being close together or even crossed. Um, that actually is less of a problem than uh, a negative slope on the udder or the teats facing forward or you know, kind of tilted forward and black. For some reason, black teats are worse with these lasers. Um, so <laughs> the rear teat close together across it actually, it'll do some funny things and get them attached. But uh, yeah, the, the tilted teats are a little bit more of a tricky part for it. So, so maybe the last one, is there any new quality <laughs> difference between the uh, the conventional system and the uh, robotic milking difference in what way yeah me quality for example you know the people talk about the freezing points 
for example, or <clears throat> bacterial uh, color? I can't say I've looked into it a lot. Uh, we were only a robotic system, so I can't compare it to our past here. Um, but I, I know, I think I understand or I've heard what you're, what you're talking about there, but I, uh, I don't know if it's been entirely backed up. Uh, Thank you. <clears throat> okay. okay. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Hadai. Um, I'm going to ask a few of the questions we have in our windows and then we'll, um, and then I'll come back around to Sean Lee. Um, Sam, how do you step down the PMR offered or eaten at um, 100 and 200 days in milk? The PMR itself is ad lib. Uh, so they, if I understand that question correctly. Yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe he actually intends it to be the, um, the grain in the robot. Um, is this in the, any, any of the chats? Is that where you're looking? Pardon me? Are, are these in the chats? Uh, this is in the Q and A. He says PMR. It's, um, if Charlie is still here, let's see if he'll clarify. Yeah, Charlie might, might, um, let's move to another one and maybe he can, um, clarify that one. Um, do you have a micron size that you target for ground corn? Small as possible. <laughs> Uh, we have an older hammer mill that we are grinding the corn through. So I, I'm sure I could get it finer. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, particle size, obviously it would be like less, less than a, a thousand, um, you know, 850 or lower would be what I'm trying to achieve. But mean particle size doesn't always tell the whole story because depending on the corn, you can sometimes get a really fine powder and then a whole bunch of the pericarp and, and harder starch, uh, all above that thousand. So uh, as tight a, a um, I guess, variance as you can get, I, I haven't delved exactly or deep into it yet to really know my, my perfect option. But at the end of the day, we're going as fine a screen as we can. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I think that um, what Charlie's asking is the farm mix that's fed through the robot. Um, oh, okay. How do you step that down at 100 and 200? Yeah, we step that down. So, so I'm stepping both feeds down at 100 at a, roughly the same amount, uh, well, same uh, relative amount to each other. So if I'm cutting it back, I don't know, 15% or something. Uh, there is a, a setting in the system that does it slowly. So it will only allow, or I'm only allowing a certain amount per day to cut back. So it kind of, it does transition slowly. It doesn't just say, okay, you're now 100 days in milk and we're going to take, you know, a kilo out. No, it's not, not like that. It does it over time. Uh, so that's how we do it at the hundred days. And then at 200 days, I pull more of that farm mix, the corn, essentially, I pull more of that out um, just to try to get that energy level down um, because those cows don't really need it um, and kind of move them off onto that pellet a little bit more, the, the gluten pellet. So. Okay. All right. Th thank you. And thank you, Charlie, for clarifying that. Yeah. Um, do you have thoughts towards an ideal haylage to corn silage ratio for robot PMR? Um, and do you have any issues with palatability on loads of corn gluten pellets? So two, so, two yeah. questions in one. I saw that from Mike. Uh, I'm glad you asked it because that's a great question. Um, and I actually got a, you know, half, half my mind was thinking about it as I was going through some of the other ones. So yeah, I, we have been a little bit short on corn silage inventory just because of, of how our agronomics or how our, our planning have kind of gone out and, and bunk space. So I have been holding back a little bit on corn silage from what I would ideally like to be feeding, especially compared to my, let's say, TMR experience. Um, right now, I'm at about 60-40 ratio, and I have pushed up to 70-30 maybe. As I get to higher levels of corn silage, I just have to manage my high moisture corn a little bit more carefully in terms of the amount of high moisture corn that's going in there, um, just to try to keep a little bit more of an effort or keep the energy differential between the PMR and the, the robot feed, um, kind of keep that differential a little more open because I can start to get pretty, pretty similar amounts of energy in the two. And I think I do see some more fetch cows and maybe a little bit of a drop in visits uh, when I push more corn silage in the bunk or in the PMR, uh, I'd love to feed more corn silage. Like, I mean, that's just, just kind of how my feeding tends to go. Uh, we do have plenty of haylage. So 
yeah, I'd say it's, it's kind of been a balance right now. When I, I will say when I was short on corn silage and feeding a lot of haylage in the, in the bunk, I had my fewest number of fetch cows. That, that part is true. I was overfeeding protein for sure, based on my MUNs and, and uh, some other indicators. Uh, but yeah, they, they really did like that energy at the robot, uh, from, from the ground corn and that sort of thing. So, uh, okay. The other side, palatability on corn gluten pellets. I don't think I've seen any issues in palatability. More of the issues I've gotten have been, uh, basically just the, the mechanics of getting the truck unloaded. Um, if they're coming in pretty hot, they tend to, to, to bridge up in the truck a lot and then bridge up in my bin. Um, so the summer loads, the loads we get during the summer that just are, are not quite as uh, cooled down yet. Those have some more issues from a mechanical standpoint, um, but the cows really didn't seem to care. I'm getting it from the same source and it's fairly consistent there, at least from what I've been testing. So I've been happy with that. Um, and the cows seem to love them. So yeah, that's been, been good so far. Okay. Um, and sort of tailing on to that um, palatability question, um, Ignatia had a question of what, what let's see, I have to find it now. Um, could you expand more on what characteristics the pellet should have? I moved to your um, feed palatability slide, just in case that helps. Sure. Yeah. I guess in my experience, when, you know, kind of going around with a lot of the consultants, you know, when we were doing AMTS trainings and stuff, and then um, talking with other nutritionists in, you know, my closer area here, uh, one of the reasons I say, you know, that, that ground feed a highly palatable ground feed like ground corn or some of the hominy that's some of the other things that cows just really seem to like you know you're really only going to be limited more on um that that eating rate um but if you start to have let's say you have a pellet that you have put in quite a few other lower palatability feeds or you're trying to get some of those additives in um or you know in some parts of the world i see quite a bit of palm kernel and you know other things going into the the pellet just to bulk it up and, and, and kind of move a few more tons. Uh, if you get fines in those sort of pellets, those fines are tend to be at least, at least from what I can see, um, tend to be what, what builds up in the bowls and, and cows then, you know, if you have a little moisture in there, that's where you get essentially spoiled feed in the bowl. And then cows just don't like to eat anything that's down in there. Um, I mean, you kind of know what it's like when a, let's say a calf pail, gets all wet from the calf being a calf, you know, you got to dump it out and get fresh, you know, feed in there. Otherwise you're kind of limiting intake. So the same thing with cows. Um, they've learned that from a very young age. So I guess that, that's kind of what I'm getting at with that, the differences and in, in fines. Um, and I think there probably is a little bit of a difference, you know, what the cows are used to. So if you're used to feeding a very hard pellet, only a pellet, there's going to be a little bit of a transition if you're going to a ground feed. Um, they got to get used to, you know, having dust all over the place and, <laughs> and that sort of thing. It does take a little bit more cleaning in the robots too. You know, there's, there's some sensors down in there and you got to keep those things clean. Otherwise you get a few more errors and a few more calls. Um, so. Okay. Um, we have, I have a bunch of questions, um, with relation to, um, PEU NDF. Um, so I'll sort of group them together. And then um, I, I have been neglectful of Sean Lee. So I'll come back around to um, asking Sean if he has any questions. Um, but first, I just have one that perhaps Sam, could you clarify a little bit for Zoran? Um, his question is about grouping cows and he just wants, I, um, so you have all of the cows in the same group and they divide only in the robot in terms of what they're getting, correct? Yep, everyone's housed in one one pen. Um, they're all getting the same PMR, but eating different levels of PMR, of course, based on their appetite. Uh, the differentiation in the robot is, you know, from the robot feed is is where I can do a little bit of, you know, more feed to this cow, less feed to that cow, uh, and then between the two feeds, you know, based on the groups of cows. So early, later, early, mid, and late lactation cows get different, obviously, different ratios of that ground corn to uh, corn gluten pellets. So okay. Thank I would you. encourage him, you know, I, I think I talk a little bit more about that, or at least the, the practical parts of stepping through that in the formulation, you know, in that AMTS that robot tool, 
in that, that guide. Um, yep. You for, did. Yeah. For different stages of lactation. Yeah. Yep. Um, so in your presentation, you said 5% is a max on PEUNDF um, that cows can eat. What's the minimum and um, what is, let's see, maybe I'm just not, what is the number equivalent in PEUNDF as a percent of body weight? Sort of guidelines, I think, is what he's looking for here. Yeah. Um, so I, I think if it was five to 5.5 is what I'm running right now with my current forages on my farm. So I know that's a very qualified statement and can really annoy a lot of people. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this is one of those instances where I would say you kind of need to develop that goal on the farm as you go. And it's going to help you understand more so about possible ration changes and expected direction of, of intakes or or uh, rumination or um, even milk production. So for me, you know, what I would suggest you start doing is kept keeping an eye on what your current diets are at. And then as you make some larger feed changes and forage changes, whatever that might be, you know, try to understand, okay, am I going up or am I going down in PEU and DF? And therefore, should I expect more or less intake? Should I expect more or less rumination? Am I getting into a, a danger zone or not? Um, but it's really something at this point, I think you gotta kind of feel out for the farm. I would say, you know, Rick, Rick had those slides a little while ago on, you know, the relationship between PEUNDF and dry matter intake, PEUNDF and rumen pH. Um, those are some excellent slides to kind of give you an idea of directionality, um, but understand they were a little bit more retrospective in, in their form. So, um, you know, that's not necessarily a specifically designed experiment. They have done some of those. So I encourage you to look at those too. But uh, yeah, and I, th I think, um, uh, what I'll do is I'll send a link to that presentation for people. The other thing, if I remember correctly, not to push the AMTS videos, but I think when Tom did his, um, his summary of the new optimizer in the program, he actually did some formulation guidelines on what he looks at. And I'll just make sure I send a link to that. And I do believe he talked a little bit about PUNDF and his ranges that he looks at. Yeah, Tom, Tom probably has some good idea on those ranges too. Um, I'm giving you what my perspective is on my farm. So uh, I haven't looked a lot at PEUNDF as a percent of body weight necessarily uh, at this point. I, I probably should because I actually have good body weights, <laughs> but a lot of people don't. So um, that, you know, always becomes subject to what you've got entered for a body weight. Uh, and that's, that's always going to be the, the challenge with those sort of uh, recommendations. Do you have an idea what the average body weight is on your herd or does it vary a lot? Uh, it varies. Of course, we, I mean, we have cows that are fourth and fifth lactation cows that are 1300 pounds. And then I've got one that's 2,300 pounds. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm varying by 450 kilos. Uh, so there, there's obviously variance. Um, I think, you know, my mature body weight right now is 1650 or 750, um, kilos. So 1650 pounds, you know, we're kind of a smaller herd just based on the animals we chose. Uh, you know, when we, when we were buying cows, we, we were looking for a little bit smaller cow, more compact, but uh, not the big typey cows. Are you spending much time doing shakeouts on your PMR? And if so, what numbers do you shoot for? On the PMR, not specific. So, okay. So I use my Penn state box on the individual silages and or the, the halogen silage, just to kind of get an idea of what my PEF factor is to use in the program. Uh, and to help me during harvest to know if I'm getting my shop length, right. Uh, so that I use it on the individual feeds at that point, what I use it for on the PMR more so I've only done it once here um, early on, and I actually probably should do it again here, but it's basically just to understand my feed drop and consistency across the bunk. Um, I'm not shooting for specific range um, really at this point on the PMR. What I'm trying to do is make sure that the stuff at one end of the bunk is pretty similar to the other end of the bunk. Um, the reason I say I probably should be doing it again here is my knives are getting dull on the mixer wagon and I'm just watching cows and they're actually probably telling me what's going on more so because I'm starting to see the front end and the back end for whatever reason, uh, the cows are grouping and eating there for longer periods during the day. Um, they're not really in the middle until it gets to be later in the day. So I'm suspecting that I'm probably not getting a good mix uh, and you know, I need to kind of do a 
a shake down, down through the bunk or, you know, really make sure my mixing times are good. So that's what I use it for. Um, obviously you can, you can use them, um, to really understand your, your distribution as well on a PMR, you're going to just have to understand that you'll have fewer fine particles because you're, you've moved some of those feeds into the robot. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Uh, th thank you, Sam. Thanks for that explanation. Um, I want to, I have a couple of questions left, but, um, first I want to give Sean an opportunity. Sean, if you have any questions you'd like to ask other than the one you put in the chat window, um, please do so. It's great to have you join us. Hi, uh, Marianne. Hi, Sam. Excellent uh, presentation. I just have one, one, one question about um, corn silage. And do you think it is, you know, if there is any uh, a different consideration about making corn silage for robotic dairy farms? On these farms, I think the cows are milked more often and uh, feeding behavior is more natural. Should we have less concern about um, human acidosis or things? Um, can we chop the corn silage finer in order to make sure it uh, compaction is better and fermentation is better? Yeah, something about corn silage considerations. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the, the question, Sean. Um, I guess off the top of my head, I'm. I'm not sure in my experience that I would say that we need to do anything fundamentally different with corn silage, um, specifically in, in robot herds. Uh, I think our goals are still the same. We want to encourage intake to be fairly steady throughout the day and according to whatever schedule it is the cows want to do. Uh, you know, I'm still targeting that 17 to 19 millimeter uh, theoretical length cut on a corn silage um, and, and good kernel processing. I don't see much of a reason to go shorter, um, at, at this point for, for, for the way we try to manage things, especially at harvest. Um, I'm targeting dry matter, you know, whole plant dry matter, um, to get that funky density and packing density correct. As long as I'm in my, my good window of, you know, if it's 35 to 40% or 32 to 36 percent dry matter at harvest. Uh, you know, at that, that length of cut is it, it packs well, as long as I get enough, you know, enough tractor on the bunk and thin enough layers, all those, those principles, I think always are going to hold the same. Yeah. And Sean, I think, um, if you have an opportunity to listen to Rick Grant's presentation that was in June, he talks a little bit about some of, um, what minor has, has applied to corn silage chop length as well. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, that's great. All right. Thank you so much. Um, Sean, did you have any follow-up questions or shall I proceed with more questions? Yeah, proceed. Uh, I have more questions. I talk with Sam later. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Thank okay. you. Um, let's see, Sam, back back to our list. What um, dry matter, day, or I'm sorry, days in milk, do you switch your transition cows to the milking tables? And um, the same person questioned if you use, and I'm always quite afraid to ask you if you do these things, do you use AMTS to um, develop and adjust the feed tables? Um, there's, there's a number of questions in this. How, how much pellet are you giving them during the transition period? And after transition during the early lactation period, how much grain do you give them? For example, cows milking more than 40 kilograms of milk. So uh, hopefully you can see that question, Sam, and start to pick it apart. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna try to pull that up because there's, there's a few there, uh, let's see. So while I'm pulling it up, I'll answer the, the AMTS part. Yes, I am using AMTS to build my feed tables. Um, I, I have used my own spreadsheet version, the develop, it's called the development version. It's what we use to help build the robot tool in AMTS, um, so that is my, that's where I've built everything and I have a little bit more flexibility in there and I can enter in, you know, all sorts of different equations that I want. Um, but at this point I have moved off to AMTS now because I feel confident in that robot tool, um, at least the way it is right now. Um, let's see. Good answer. <laughs> Trying to find, find the question. Maybe I'm not. 
Um, it's going to be, it came in around 1040 and it's from Basim Rafat. In the chat window. Yeah, I'm trying to find my chat window. Enough windows open. Uh, so I'll try to. I had minimized it, of course. Okay. Okay, so for changing my cows over to the feed tables, trying to pull that up. Make sure I gave the right answer. I gave the answer that we're doing. So on my feed table, I go I go to a milk. Um, I should say feed to milk type table at day six. So for the first five days, I kind of have just a steady amount of gluten pellets and a small amount of the, the corn in there. Um, and so that's, you know, for me, that's right around, uh, I guess, two to three kilos of gluten pellets and one to two of, uh, of cornmeal with that smart amine in it um, or a protective amino acid. Uh, then at day six, I go to a milk to feed table. Um, and they, th that holds till day 21 when I cut out, I, I do have a liquid feeding system to add uh, propylene glycol. If I remember to fill the thing, I, I am feeding propylene glycol, but honestly, most of the time I'm not actually putting propylene glycol in. I'm, I'm not sure it really gives me that much of a boost given the number of feedings and how, how quickly it doses it out. I'm still not entirely convinced on that one. Um, but at 21 days, that would be done anyway. And we go onto the, the big feed tables where I, you know, it goes up to larger amounts of milk and um, kind of help push the pellet up. So yeah, I guess one of the key things I've found on that is at least for my herd, trying to make sure that I have a hundred, well, let's see, transfer over kilos. Uh, you know, 150 pounds or 68 kilos. Um, and making sure my feed table covers that. And even in the first 21 days, in case I do have cows that really want to take off, I'm not necessarily, uh, you know, plateauing them on feed, but I also want to manage them not getting too much feed in. So uh, let's see. So that's kind of how my transitioning is going. Um, cows milking over 40 kilos. Uh, we, I typically in that, let's see, typically in that first hundred days, I'm right now total feed in the robot will be, um, well, I mean, kilos. Pam. <laughs> yeah. Are you there? I'm sorry. Um, are you sharing your screen or hoping to? I am not. No. Oh, okay. All right. I just, I had a question and I'm sorry. I was paying less attention than I'm supposed to um, while you were answering. <laughs> okay. Sorry. So I, I, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I'm, so I'm somewhere around um, 11 to 12 pounds of concentrate per hundred pounds of milk uh, in that earlier lactation period. And then after that, I stepped down below 10 is kind of my goal pounds of concentrate per hundred pounds of milk. Um, so if you wanted to say over 45 kilos, I'm typically, uh, right around five kilos, uh, for those cows over 40. And then once I get below, you know, or past hundred days, then I tend to drop it down to, let's say four kilos or less for cows at 40 kilos. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you for working that out. Um, Let's see, I have, I, I think I'm down to the last question, um, unless I see more. Um, and I, I think you covered this, but it's good to reiterate, how low is your free time percentage while still being satisfied with fetching and milking per day? Uh, my free time right now is uh, eight to 10%. I have probably space for another five cows, five, six cows um, in the barn. 
on, on the robots free time side of things. Uh, when I do that, I will probably see just a dip in, in visits a little bit, my guess. Um, and then also maybe a few more fetch cows, uh, those late lactation cows that are just kind of not necessarily having that drive to come to the robot as much. Uh, yeah, that's probably what I'll see. When I, over the summer, I had a lower number of animals in the robot just because we are fairly heavy fall calving. And that's when I had the fewest number of <laughs> fetch cows um, because I had so much free time. I had 15 to 20% free time. So makes it great for doing chores. You can do them really quick and, you know, just walk the herd and scrape some stalls and, and that sort of thing. But uh, I'm obviously not maximizing my uh, investment in the robots at that point. So yeah, it has to be a balance between those two. Uh Thanks. Recognizing that your sample size is pretty small. Um, have you run into any strong willed first calves, first calving heifers that won't use a robot or any cows that just won't adjust? Uh, yeah. So first calf heifers, um, I've had them take to the robot as quickly as, you know, two to three days that they come in on their own. And then after four or five days, I don't fetch them anymore because they're coming in often enough. Uh, I'd say typical is two to three weeks of, yeah, that's the last time I fetch them is two to three weeks after calving, but they finally figured it out to come in often enough. Uh, I have had a stubborn first calf heifer that she did not come into the robot by herself for 50 days. And the day she came in, I thought it was a fluke. I thought she must've just gotten pushed in there by another cow or something, um, but yeah, she was kind of really a pain. She's not really a great producer. Um, I'm surprised I've let her be in the herd this long. But of course, she's the one that got pregnant right away and, you know, kind of has been fairly persistent now. But she's now getting late lactation and has showed up on the fetch list again. So I, I think her brain's probably smaller than the rest of the cows. <laughs> Okay. Um, so I don't have any more questions. Who die? Um, Sean Lee. Does anyone have anything they want to ask before we let Sam get a little um, other work done before he has to come back? Yeah, I have one more question. Okay, uh, thank you. Dad. Yeah, it is about the, uh, your, your feed table. I think I noticed the uh, glucose sugar that you were using in the first 20 days of the lactation. Is that right? Uh, yeah, glucose sugar is what I, I had entered it in as that. I've kind of gone back and forth a little bit between glucose sugar and, and propylene glycol. But. How do you add this one to the feed? In this, do you have another special bean for that? Or is it liquid or? Yeah, that's a liquid feed. Yeah, so it gets added through the, the liquid feed dosing unit. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, Thank you, Sam. Um, we had many people who, who left maybe a little earlier that thanked you for a great presentation. Um, and, in, and I don't know if you noticed your cousin was in here. I don't know if she's left yeah. yet, but yeah. So Kate was here. She left. I was hoping she'd ask a question. <laughs> All right. Thanks very much, Sam. And I'll see you this afternoon. Thank you, everybody, for attending and um, attending all the webinars that you've attended this year. So um, we'll be back next year and I'll be getting people's, um, I'll be getting the schedule to people in the next couple of months. So thanks everybody. All right, thank you all. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye, thanks.